Welcome back to the bluegrass on this beautiful but kind of hot July morning. Okay, so we're out uh, exercising dogs and training dogs. And what we're going to do today is we're just going to work uh, a bunch of dogs in what I would consider suboptimal conditions and give you an idea of what dog training might look at your look like at your house uh, and how that might be different than what you see on Instagram and TikTok. Uh, okay, Charlie, go ahead and turn this hose off. All right, so you know the first thing oh that you notice. Whenever you're watching Instagram or TikTok or short form uh, YouTube videos, is that all the dogs seem super excited about doing obedience and they do everything with a lot of speed and precision and flash. Okay, guys, dog trainers pick dogs that look like that. <laughs> look at this dog. Okay, this dog's obviously built for uh, comfort, not speed. <laughs> Uh, and this idea of working hard is going from one air conditioner vent to the other during the day, which, you know, that's fine for where that dog's going to live, okay? Uh, look at this dog. This dog loves being outside, and she loves being in the water. Uh, that dog loves outside and loves being in the water. This dog loves outside and being in the water, okay? But they're all three Labrador Retrievers, which are kind of cold weather dogs. And so, like, it can be a struggle to get them out and get them to do things in the summertime unless you can adapt, adjust your schedule so that you can do things early in the morning or late in the evening, which is why we're out, out, out here in the pool. I have, like, middle of the day work to do, right? And so, in the wintertime, that's really easy. Come on, come on, come on. Uh, in the summertime, it's not so easy. So what I have to do in the summertime is I have to hose these dogs down. I have to get them in the pool. I have to cool them off so that we can get some, uh, you know, some training volume. Okay. And so, guys, when the dogs are hot and when they're tired, even though I put them in the pool, okay, they don't look all that impressive when we're doing our training sessions. So I'm going to work all these dogs, and we're just going to talk about each individual dog, and I'm going to show you what it looks like in reality. Okay, not a 30 second clip, not a one minute clip where I can make the dogs look perfect, but I'm going to work a bunch of dogs and we're just going to see how, like, how much work it is when uh, conditions aren't perfect and how much work it is to get multiple minutes of good behavior instead of a 30 second clip. Okay, I mean, the first thing you'll notice is I'm soaking wet. And I didn't really have any choice today because it's hot. And what happened to me is that, you know, every time that I would try to get out here and start working on, uh, you know, our obedience routine, uh, well, then, like, the dogs would just want to go lay over in the shade. And it's understandable. You know, we had people out all morning, and these dogs have had a lot of social interactions. They've been around a lot of dogs, and they're just kind of done with it. And you know what that's like. You ever been at work? and you're just, you just kind of get done with it, you know? Like, or you ever been even at a party or at a social event, and it was really fun for a while, you know, but then, like, you just kind of get ready to, to go home. You get kind of ready to go lay down, you know? And a lot of these dogs, you know, they just, they, they get ready to go lay down. And they, the reason they do is because not every dog that comes here is a super athlete. Max, come here, Max. I mean, let's take Max, for example, okay? So, I knew Max when Max was a puppy. So let's bypass the tunnel, cameraman, so I can, I can make a point with this later. I knew Max when Max was a puppy, okay? And so Max's owner contacted me, and she said, you know, Max has been acting pretty aggressive with the other dogs at the barn. And I'm like, well, what do you mean? And she says, well, whenever the other dogs get close to him, like he's getting really snappy and, and he's biting them. I said, is he like attacking them? Like trying to, you know, not trying to harm them? And she said, no, not really. He's biting them with the, you know, kind of the front of his teeth and telling them to get away from him. Well, you know, on the phone, my, my initial reaction is always kind of the same. If a dog's displaying some atypical behavior, the first thing I do is I think, well, is the dog not feeling well? And I said, is there anything going on with Max where he might not be doing well? And she goes, well, he had knee surgery. And I said, okay, well, that, that makes sense because I've had knee surgery and my knee still hurts. And I said, well, let's, let's go get him checked out and see if there's anything else wrong with him. Well, Max gets in the pool a lot, and Max had a little bit of an ear infection. So between knee, knee surgery and a little bit of an ear infection, you know, we start to go, okay, well, it starts, it's understandable why, you know, Max might be, be a little grouchy. I said, but bring him on down here so I can put him around a lot of other dogs, and we can kind of, you know, we can kind of see what's going on and make sure that he's not, for some reason or another, uh, becoming a liability. And the first thing that I noticed when Max got out of the car uh, is that Max, you know, he's pretty, well, just, just, let's, let's, not, let's, not, let's not mince words here, okay? Max is pretty fat. Hey, look at this, okay? You see that? Guys, when a dog is carrying extra weight, 
right? And they go out and they start doing the things that they've done their whole lives. That extra weight starts to wear on them. It wears on their joints, okay? But another thing it does, it just fatigues them very, very, you know, it, it fatigues them a lot. It fatigues them very quickly. So if you take a dog to say, to say the barn, okay, where the dog's been used to kind of running around and hanging out, uh, where used to, when this dog was young and he was fit, he would get to run around and he would gradually get tired over the course of the day. But the fatigue wasn't a quick onset. The, que the fatigue wasn't debilitating. But as he gains weight, okay, that fatigue sets in very quickly. And not only does it set in very quickly, but it also is a deep-seated type of fatigue that, um, you know, affects the dog's attitude. And so we have a multi-compounding problem here. The dog started getting fat. Uh, the weight probably contributed to the dog needing knee surgery. The knee surgeries never work 100%. Okay. The dog wants to spend a lot of time in the pool because, you know, like if you're fat, the pool's a fun place to be because it keeps all your, <laughs> it keeps, you know, you're buoyant and keeps all the weight off your, off your musculoskeletal system, right? Um, so he ends up hurting his knee. And then he's got to be put up on exercise restriction uh, to let his knee have time to heal. Well, when he's put up, he ain't doing anything, so he's bored. So what's he want to do? He wants to eat on things. Well, there are very few families in the world that can watch a dog be super bored and super hungry and not give them anything to chew on, not give them anything to alleviate their anxiety, like a stuffed Kong or a bully stick or other things like that. Well, what happens is when you start to give them those things, for those, those soothing mechanisms, you end up inadvertently, you know, putting them over into the excess uh, calorie range and they even get fatter. So the dogs get fat, they get hurt, they, they have surgery, the surgery restricts their exercise, which makes them get fatter, right? And then you feel bad about them being hungry and bored, so you feed them, which makes them get fatter. And the next thing you know, this is why we skipped the tunnel in the beginning, the next thing you know, the dogs are too fat to go through the tunnel. So look at this, watch, you see, see how he's trying to avoid that tunnel? He's afraid he's going to get stuck in the tunnel. Now, when Max was little, he used to go through this uh, tunnel all the time. And that's my general rule here. If it's not a giant breed dog, it ought to be able to go through my tunnel. Right? And if it's too fat to go through my tunnel, well, then it's too fat to be living up to its full potential. And that's the truth. So I get a dog like Max here, right? And I've got to get him out. Oh, my gosh, be careful. I've got to get him out, and I've got to exercise him, and I've got to do some remedial socialization with him because, like, when a dog has had some success at being grouchy with other dogs, uh, that oftentimes becomes a default pattern of behavior, you know? Like, anything you do in your life that works, come on, nerd. Anything you do in your life that works, you have a tendency to repeat it, right? Okay, well, it doesn't matter how Max ended up uh, getting to the point to where he was being aggressive with the other dogs. He's now been aggressive with the other dogs and he knows that it works. Okay, so we have to do a lot of things. We have to get him out and we have to put him in lots of situations where he has to show impulse control. We have to redevelop his attention span and we have to do a remedial socialization based on tons and tons of exposure. Uh, but to do all that, I have to be able to get him out a bunch during the day, and I can't get him out a bunch during the day if I can't keep him cool, uh, because since he's fat, he already gets tired easy, and uh, when he gets tired, he, you know, he's hot, and he wants to just go lay in the shade, so we gotta put him in the pool all the time. Okay? So that's what real dog training looks like. You'll see, a, you know, you'll, see a, you'll see a little Instagram clip, and it would be like, oh, your dog's reactive, do these five things, and it'd be a 30 second or one minute clip, but doing those five things, okay, it leaves out a tremendous amount of the information uh, that's needed to actually do those five things effectively. Okay, that's what I want you to understand about dog training. You guys, look at me. I mean, it's the middle of the morning, late, maybe almost lunch, and I'm covered head to toe with dog slobber and dirty pool water. Okay, and I'm still out here putting in the work. And I'm gonna be wet for a considerable amount more time because I have a lot of dogs to finish working because I was talking to a lot of people this morning. And when I'm talking to a lot of people, some of my stuff gets, you know, it gets pushed to later in the day. And that's the way your life was gonna be. So this dog's name is Henry. And Henry's an awesome dog. Now, like with Max, I have to continually hose him off to be able to get the repetitions that I need in per day, okay? I've gotta get him out and exercise him, but to exercise him, I gotta keep him cool. I don't have that problem with this dog. Right, this dog's awesome. He's a collie, he's white. The white reflects the heat pretty well. He's pretty fine bone, he's skinny. He does really well in the heat, okay? The problem with this little dog is that he has a pretty high endurance level, right? Okay, so I had him out playing with kids all morning and uh, you know, like he did great. 
but he's not tired yet. <laughs> like he still wants to get out and do some stuff. And so I have to get him, uh, you know, I have to get repetitions here of the dogs like learning to behave well when they're full of energy. But I also have to get plenty of repetitions in of the dogs learning to behave well even when they're tired. And you might say, well, Stoney, what does that matter? Well, for those of you who have, had, who have children, who have had puppies before, you know sometimes they get into like a super, like kind of uh, overstimulated or, or overtired state, and they can get a little grouchy or nippy. Well, all the different herding dogs, if they get overstimulated and they get overtired, then they can get a little nippy. They can get a little grouchy too at night, okay? If you only practice your obedience, early in the morning or practice that practice with the dog is full of energy and in the mood to train, well then what you end up with is a nice flashy dog that performs well when there's obvious extrinsic motivator. You know, they're, they're, they're looking up, they want the ball, they want the treat, they want your attention. Okay, but when they get a little bit tired, okay, you don't have that same level of control. So one of the things that you don't think about when you're training, when you're watching the Instagram clips, you don't think about, hey, so that's a dog that obviously is motivated for the ball and he's obviously motivated for the food and the attention. Come on, dude. But what happens, what happens when they get like in a different mind, mindset, right? Like right here, he comes in that tunnel and he says, I think I'll just stay in here for a little while, Stoney. He doesn't really want any more food, and he doesn't really want to, any more affection because he's had a lot of affection from a lot of kids all morning, right? He doesn't really want to chase a ball, right? He just kind of wants to do what he wants to do. This is where you have to teach a dog that sometimes they have to do things just because you said so, and it doesn't matter if they're overstimulated or overtired. Okay? They just have to do it. But to reach this point, I have to put in a certain amount of training volume every day. Okay? So, look, he says, I can't do it. And I say, well, you have to do it. This isn't a, this isn't a do it if you want to game, right? This is a do it because I said so game. <laughs> and that's very important. And people don't tell you that. They don't tell you that, you know. They say, here, get your treat out. Get your ball out. Love on the dog or get whatever it is. Okay? But they don't tell you to go ahead and get enough training volume so that you can address the dog's uh, ability to stay focused and mind under all the different, you know, kind, kind of uh, mindsets and moods that the dog might uh, develop over the course of a day. You know how it is with the dog. When you get them out early in the morning, they're full of life and energy and they want to do everything with you. And then when they get hungry, they start to have a little different mindset. If your, if your Aunt Susie comes over, they have a little different mindset. If the kids from next door come over, if it's, you know, bedtime and they're a little overstimulated, they have a little different mindset. Okay. So when you're doing your training, the things that you're, that you're attempting to do, you have to make sure that you have an alternative strategy for when those things aren't working. And you're not going to know that unless, you know, you do a lot of training every single day. Now this is my dog Annie. Now Annie's a really good dog because you know she's bred, uh, she's a field bred American Labrador Retriever. She's bred to do work all day long in conjunction with the handler and as long as we're doing stuff together she's really just about perfect. She doesn't give me any trouble at all. You know where I have trouble with Annie is when we stop doing things. Okay, so I can get out here and uh, we can have kids out all morning. We can have, uh, we can go four wheeler riding, we can go motorcycle riding, we can take these dogs over to the farm. And no matter what's going on, like she's ready to rock and roll. But you know where this dog gives me trouble? She gives me trouble when it's time to just not do anything. And you'll see people, like, I, <laughs> I, think, I think YouTube trends are kind of funny because for those of you who don't know, there's what's called a creator studio. And so what dog trainers do, especially dog trainers who don't actually own a kennel and don't actually spend all day with dogs every day, right? They just, uh, they kind of make a list of trending topics and they just do, you know, kind of whatever's popular so that their videos will get featured in the algorithms. And one of the things you see a lot now is you'll see this advice. Oh, just go somewhere and do nothing. I'm not going somewhere to do nothing. I'm going somewhere to do something. And I want the dog to be able to integrate itself into whatever activity that is, okay? And I just have to know that when I go somewhere, I need to be able to look busy, and the dog needs to be able to self-regulate. And that self-regulation comes from a, a lot of experience and a lot of exposure uh, under a you know, broad range of environmental conditions. And this is the type of thing that your dog needs to learn how to deal with. See, I had going to have Annie come through the tunnel, right? And this dog clogged up the tunnel. And just a minute ago, I had a golden retriever clogging up the tunnel. That's what my life really looks like, 
you know. Now a lot of times, what we do is we make videos usually like when the dogs have been here, you know, quite a few days in a row. And so all the dogs will be going through the course and everybody will be, you know, it's just like, it's like going to school. Everybody learns how to get in a line and learn how to maintain a relative amount of space between them and the other students. And that'll happen here, okay. But these dogs haven't all been here the same amount of time. And so they're not very good at, uh, you know, not very good at standing in line. It's kind of like homeschool kids. If you've ever, if you've ever been in a situation where you had to like be around homeschool kids and you tell them to get in a the line, they don't know how, right? That's the only bad thing about homeschool. All right, so Annie ended up having to get up and go around. Okay, so Annie, perfect dog, like as long as I'm doing stuff. So what do I have to do? Is I have to, you know, kind of randomly incorporate time during the day where we're doing stuff and just I make her stop, right? But when I make her stop, sit. Okay, I make Annie stop and sit while I keep doing stuff. Okay, that's what's important. I'm not gonna be out just stopping myself. I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna be doing stuff and I'm gonna say, look, sometimes you're gonna be bored and you're gonna get over there. And I have to work on this with Annie over and over and over again during the day because that's really hard for Annie. Okay, but it doesn't work like what you see on Instagram where you just go out and you're on a leash and you just sit down. Okay, because how many people can just go out and sit and do nothing all day? Right? If you want to really integrate your dog in your lifestyle, okay, and you want the dog to learn how to, to chill and kind of do nothing, what's, what's the point of that? If I have time to sit here with her, I can pet on her and love on her and stuff like that. I need the dog to sit and be still while I'm busy. So I teach her to stay, and then I go do stuff. And we do it every day because that's the kind of problem I have with that particular dog. Okay, so let's see who else we can mind. Let me go over here. I'm going to round up a German short hair pointer. Okay, so uh, I went and got this dog. She was over there chasing butterflies. And when she's chasing butterflies, uh, like it's kind of hard to interrupt that behavior. Kasha didn't come here till she was a little bit older, and so she missed out on a little bit of that formative experience that leads to really good uh, attention span and impulse control and the ability to leave things that she finds interesting. And so with uh, Kasha, Kasha belongs to a lady. She's about 70 years old. She's not the fastest person in the world at 70, you know. And so you could see where, like, uh, managing a young German short hair pointer can be problematic. Again, so we get back to addressing the particulars of the situation. Uh, total training volume, we're gonna get out, we're gonna move around, we're gonna do a lot of interesting stuff, but this dog's gonna learn to perform, you know, even when she's busy doing other stuff, okay? So the lady that owns this dog, the reason it didn't come here when it was real young is, is she's a pretty good little dog trainer, you know. Uh, she would sit around her house and in her yard, come on, come on nerds, and she would teach Kasha, uh, she would teach her sit and down and stand and heel uh, and all the various things that you see on YouTube or Instagram. Okay? But what she didn't have the ability to do was put the dog in enough situations under uh, you know, a broad level, a broad array of environmental conditions so that the dog transferred uh, the skill sets that were developed initially okay, across the board. So she ended up with a dog that minds really, really well in the absence of distractions and then doesn't mind at all uh, when there are lots of distractions around. Okay. And that's typical, a lot of you guys will do that. And that can also, you know, that's what's so frustrating about learning dog training technique, again, is you just don't know what you don't know. And so you're at home and you're working on your little recall games and you're working on leash manners and you're working on sitting and staying and place and all that different stuff that you see on TV. But then as soon as you go into a different environment or something new comes into your environment, it all falls to pieces. It just falls to pieces because you needed to put in more work. You know, you needed to get out and you needed to think about, hey, am I covering all the different bases here? Am I making sure, am I making sure that these dogs are going to be able to perform minus oh, the exact perfect <laughs> set of environmental conditions? Okay, so I'm just trying to get Kasha out of, the, out of the thing and I have a whole log jam here. Come on, Kasha, you can do it. Come on, nerd. Oh, so for every time that you've ever watched one of my videos and you see me seamlessly like coming around and dropping the leash and the dog running through the tunnel, right? And me picking the leash up right here. There's a whole bunch of that that goes on too, you know? Like there's a whole bunch of that. And you have to be ready for that in your life. You're going to get out and you're going to get your ball out. You're going to get your food out. You're going to like, 
<laughs> you're going to get your leash collar out. And you're going to talk really good to the dog. And you're going to say yes or whatever nonsense you're saying, right? Okay, and then when somebody comes over, you are going to fall victim to what we call the watch this problem, okay? With a dog, basically every time that you tell somebody to watch this, you are sentencing yourself to abject failure, <laughs> right? Because when are you practicing? You're practicing when you're at home alone with your dog, or maybe there are people in the environment, but nobody's focusing on the dog. And all of a sudden, you say, hey, watch this, and every, all the eyes turn on the dog. And you're like, why is my dog not performing? Well, think about yourself. You do lots of things during the day. What if you went into a situation that you normally go into to do what you normally do, and like everybody stopped what they were doing and started staring at you? So if you want a dog to mind when people are staring at it, you got to go practice. And practice means that you're going to fail some. And you always want to be challenging the dog, right? So if you're practicing and you're not having a certain amount of failure, you're not, you're not practicing in a challenging enough environment. If you're, if you're practicing in an environment that consistently induces uh, failure, well, then you're practicing in an environment that you're not ready for. Again, it's this, this idea that you don't know what you don't know. Hey, Charlotte, let Woody out there. So I'm going to let another dog out. He's laid up in the air conditioner. You know, uh, some of the dogs come here and they're great. So this, I got this pit bull mix and he's been here for a long time and he's a really awesome dog. He comes out and he runs around, he runs himself just ragged. And then he goes over and he lays down by the door. But he's so good at doing his obedience stuff most of the time that like uh, if he wants to go in and uh, get under the air conditioner for a while, then I let him. But I let Woody out for a specific reason, okay? Kasha is a really fickle dog in that she goes from boyfriend to boyfriend. Now last month I had a dog named Jinx here and Kasha would get really excited when Jinx would come out. Well Kasha also gets really excited when Woody comes out. So this illustrates another one of your problems. I mean if I have the problem guys you for sure are going to have the problem. You can have your dog and you can go out and you can do a lot of work. You can even get some work in where people are staring at you. You can get some work in around other dogs and then all of a sudden one particular dog shows up and like it seems like your dog's never had a lick of training in her life okay this dog is he just really likes certain boy dogs that's just the way it is you know now i can have over the course of a month i can see 30 or 40 dogs out here and out of 30 or 40 of them like you know kasha likes them all she's fine she gets along with them well but like she doesn't get super excited like, she doesn't chase them around and, and, and nibble on their ear. She doesn't prance in front of them, okay? But one, one out of that 30 or 40, okay, she gets really tore up about. And she minds different, okay? And you got to just expect that. You know, she's something else she gets tired, you know, fired up about. She gets fired up about uh, butterflies. So you can be out and she can see squirrels and rabbits and deer and even birds. And, like, she gets a little interested in them, but not that much. But, man, if we get, like, over on my farm, come here, Woody. If we get around a big bunch of butterflies, it's really tough to control her. Right? And the only way that I know that stuff is by, you know, is because we get out every day and we look for more and more challenging things to do. Now the last dog we'll walk here is Woody. And Woody's a good dog. Come on dogs, come on nerds. Get out of there, me. Come on, get out of the way. Very nice. Okay, Woody's an awesome dog. Woody's a pit bull mix. Woody lives at Ole Miss uh, with a whole bunch of uh, sorority girls. And Woody's an awesome dog. He loves to party. He gets along with uh, most everybody. Okay. Uh, he's used to getting doted on, you know. Now, so when I go to training Woody, what do I think about, right? What do I think about with Woody? What are we gonna say? Because obviously, like getting Woody to mind because he's very pattern cognizant, he's easy to motivate, he's got a rock solid temperament. Get, training him's easy. He learns really quickly. You know, he loves food. He loves attention. He likes to play tug. There's lots of stuff I can I can control, and I can say, hey, Woody, like if you'll come and be still and have good manners, I'll do one of these activities with you. Okay, There's lots of that stuff that he does well. So I gotta start thinking about myself. Well, I mean, every day I'm getting out with Woody, and he is uh, he's really adapted to our routine perfectly. And this is what you gotta be careful of because, like, when you run a dog kennel, you're really excited when a dog matches your day like their personality matches your training style because like it, it makes the day easy, okay? The problem that Woody's gonna face is that like, uh, you know, a whole bunch of college girls, they have a more exciting and interesting lifestyle than what 
a 50 year old dog trainer has, right? So what I have to do with Woody is I'll get him out and I'll let a lot of people come over and like pet him and love on him, right? And right in the middle of everybody being nice to him, I just take him inside and put him up. Because here's what I'm thinking is going to happen to Woody. He's going to be like hanging out at Ole Miss and everybody's going to come over and they're going to be making over Woody and they're going to be having a good time and everybody's going to be giggling and laughing and whatever. Hey, and then they're all going to load up in their Ubers and they're going to go out to the party, right? And guess who, look at his face, <laughs> guess who doesn't get to go out and party? This guy right here. And that's not fair. And so what am I trying to prepare him for? I'm trying to prepare him for situations where there's a lot of fun, a lot of energy, a lot of goings on, you know, and all of a sudden it just comes to a stop and everybody leaves. And that's where he really struggles. So it's like sometimes we'll just be out here and we'll have a bunch of families out. We'll be playing and carrying on and Woody will be playing with the dogs. And I just go over there and I stick him in the building. I say, here, you have to go in the office for a little while. And you know what Woody thinks? He thinks, well, that's not fair. And what I'm trying to prepare Woody for is the fact that life's not fair. And so if I was just training him, you know, based on can I get him to, uh, to walk nicely on a leash? Can I get him to stay where I put him? Can I get him to uh, like play tug? Can I get him to be good with the other dogs? I would have thought that I was done training Woody a long time ago. Okay, because Woody picked that stuff up right off the bat, you know. But then we got to thinking about what Woody's life's really going to be like. Oh my gosh, he's a very good dog. And we started thinking about, well, for sure he's going to get a lot of attention, you know. But that whole lot of attention that he gets is going to be periodically interrupted by an abrupt withdrawal of attention. Okay? And so when I started doing that, I had fallen into a trap with Woody where I would come out and we would do our obedience exercises and I'd let him go play. I was kind of basically letting him act like my labs. I was just letting him pal around with my labs all the time. And Woody had kind of become his own, you know, a pit bull version of a, of a mentor dog. And I, and I stopped one day and I realized that I was leaving a gaping hole in his training. I was thinking about how college kids love on the dogs and how college kids have a lot of people over at their place and how, you know, like there's a lot of goings on. And then I, you know, had to really dig hard in my memory, but then I remembered, okay, well, you know, here's what happens. Everybody comes over to the house and then everybody loads up and goes out. And Woody is the poor guy that's left behind that nobody wanted to take with him. You know, so we started doing that. And the first few days that we did it, what would happen, cameraman, when I put him in the building? Oh, he would just sit there and look out the door and just whine and cry and just have a go to pieces, you know. And, uh, you know, so guys, if, if somebody like me uh, can overlook aspects of dog training, right, and I do it every day, well, of course you can. And so the key is not, you know, don't get, don't get, don't get tore up like if you miss something, if you're having problems with your dogs. We all have problems. We all have problems when we're training dogs. Okay, no matter who you are, but I can tell you this for sure. Okay, you have to stop modeling your dog training off of these 30 second and one minute uh, instructionals. Okay, dog training is not about 30 second and one minute increments. Dog training is about developing over the course of time the ability for your dog to integrate itself into your personal environment. Okay, and so we walked a few different dogs today and we talked about a few different personality characteristics. We talked about some physical differences and we also talked about the, um, you know, the individual differences in terms of the dog's uh, living situations, okay? And so what I want you to understand is that nobody, not me, and I make long form content, but especially people that make short, short form content, nobody, right, can tell you exactly what you need to do every day to have the perfect dog for your lifestyle, okay? You know, what we can do is we can tell you these are the ways that you can influence a dog. Now take these ways to influence a dog, start integrating it into your lifestyle, and then track the results Okay, be prepared for some failure, okay, and make adjustments as you go, and over the course of time, you're going to move in the direction of having a dog. It'll come when you call it, and be still when you tell it, and have good manners, and it may be accomplished whatever specific goals that you want to have. But guys, your dogs aren't going to mind all day like you see in 30-second clips. They're not going to mind all day like you see in one-minute clips, okay? What we're after is dogs that mind the way that people that you like to enjoy spend your time with mind. They just integrate themselves, and they're non-obtrusive, 
okay? And like being with them doesn't produce a burden on you or anyone else that they come in contact with. Okay, all of these dogs are different in terms of specific personalities. This dog lives with somebody that's about 70 years old, has a big farm, okay? So this dog's in a good spot. But the lady that owns this dog's had golden retrievers for a long time, so as she gets older, like, She's a little bit more limited in the things that she can do, so we have to make certain adaptations. This dog lives with me at a dog kennel where you get to see lots of dogs. We have uh, lots of farms, lots of areas that we go to that are super fun. So this dog's in a perfect environment for itself. This dog lives with a bunch of college girls, okay? And it's in a perfect environment, minus the fact that he's not going to be the center of their attention 100% of the time. Now, if I ask you, if I said, if it, is it better to be the center of a bunch of college girls' attention <laughs> part of the day than none of the day? Most of you out there would say, yeah, I wouldn't mind being the center of a bunch of college girls' attention. Uh, but think about what would happen when they withdraw that attention. It'd bum you out. So you have to prepare your dogs for each situation that they're in. Okay, so that's our, little, uh, that's our little pitch for the day, is I just wanted to show you a bunch of dogs. I wanted to show you that dog training is not perfect and that you have to get out and you have to train past the, you know, past the fun and like interesting and flashy parts of dog training and well into the uh, elements of your day that might get in the way of your dog being, uh, you know, what we would consider a good canine companion because dogs aren't always perfect, just like you aren't always perfect. So you have friends and you're a good friend, you're a good companion to those people okay but you're not a perfect companion so I want you to take that into consideration get out there make some adjustments to your training schedule and start thinking long term not short term alright I'll see you guys next week